Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight, virtually from your homes. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Serena. I'm the Chicago Chair of Women in Sales Everywhere, or colloquially, WISE. Um, for those of you who are new to WISE, WISE is a division of Closer IQ and a global community building the next generation of female sales leaders, just like all of you who have joined us tonight. Um, we're so excited that you're sharing your evenings with us if you want to grab your glass of wine or your cocktail of choice. Um, I think this is gonna be a really incredible evening. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to say that none of what we do here at WISE would be possible without our incredible corporate sponsors who make this possible. Um, a big thanks to our sponsor, Sales Loft. One of our panelists, Jess Kleck, is from Sales Loft. Uh, Handshake, Udemy, Rapid7, Segment, Sysense, Pendo, HubSpot, FreshBooks, Okta, and Datadog. I have to say that list gets longer every quarter. It used to be much easier to get through. Um, feel free to reach out to members of the team from our sponsor companies to learn more, or you can always check out our website at womeninsaleseverywhere.com. Um, a couple of housekeeping items to note before we dive into the discussion. Uh, after the panel discussion, we'll be doing a Q&A session. So there's a little button at the bottom of your screen that says, ask a question. Um, as the panelists are talking, if there's something you want to know more about, or if there's something you'd love Lila and Jess to elaborate on, just toss it into the ask a question box. And I'll make sure then we build time in at the end of the panel. If you put questions in during the panel, then I'll make sure I allocate enough time. Um, but anytime, beginning, middle, or end is totally fine to drop them in. Um, we have the WISE team and myself fielding those questions, and we will make sure we answer them. The chat section on the right, which I see some of you guys are using and our panelists have used as well, is a good spot just to say hello, say where you're tuning in from, share anything funny you feel like sharing tonight. Um, tonight, we're really excited to be chatting about how to move your career in sales forward. This year has been Oh my gosh, so many things. Sad, hard, strained, fueled with wine and Zoom calls, um, and so much more. But that doesn't mean that it isn't possible to advance at work. There's still things you can be doing to push your career forward, even in this job market. Um, and I really hope tonight's discussion offers you tactical solutions on how to unlock upward mobility in your respective roles. I'm joined by two panelists tonight who have both done an exceptional job of unlocking upward mobility in really different ways over the course of their careers um, and who have both achieved strong success in sales. Uh, I think they have incredibly unique perspectives on how to excel in this market and they're full of great suggestions for all of you. Um, and so I'm excited to get into discussion with them. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Um, Jess, do you wanna go first? I would love to. Thanks for having me, Serena. I'm Jess Beck. I'm currently SVP of sales at Sales Loft, one of our sponsors. Uh, prior to that, I led some teams at LinkedIn, and prior to that, I led teams at Cornerstone and some other places. Um, this is my fifth or sixth panel for WISE, so uh, I'm right at home and very excited to be back. So thanks for having me again. Wonderful. Thank you. It's nice to see you again. Um, Lila, do you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Lila Jones, and I am head of sales for our corporate team in Chicago at Google. Tons of fun with that. Uh, prior to this role, I spent some time at Microsoft, spent a little time at Oracle, so you could call me the big tech girl. Um, and uh, I'm new to WISE, so super excited to get to know this community. Uh, my family and I live in Irving Park, so we are blue line. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're spending most of our time these days trying to find outdoor activities and different forest preserves that uh, just give us an opportunity to connect with nature and disconnect from our devices. So that's us in a package. Sounds great. <laughs> that's us uh, in a Zoom class. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. Um, I forgot to mention this, but outside of WISE, my day job is VP of sales at Shop Runner here in Chicago. Um, so ladies. Both of you have had multiple sustained promotions within a single organization, um, both at the organizations you were at prior, but then you've also advanced Jess at Salesloft and Lila at Google. Historically, have you advocated or asked for a promotion or have you waited for one to be bestowed upon you? Um, and maybe how has that position changed as you've matured in your career and developed confidence? Uh, Lila, we'll have you start with this one. Wow, have it bestowed upon me, wouldn't that be nice? 
Uh, <laughs> we are bestowing a promotion on you. Somebody <laughs> do a drum roll. Uh, I think it's interesting. I have wanted to pro pro progress my career for quite some time. Um, in Microsoft, I ra rose my hand. At Oracle, I, ra you know, I was raising my hand. At EMC, I was raising my hand. And so I, I had some practice in raising my hand and doing the work and trying to get on the quote unquote bench. We've all heard that, right? Like a role becomes available and people kind of already know who they're grooming on their bench. Um, and so how has that changed? I think when I was early in my career, I was more so waiting for somebody to give me the permission to get on the bench versus saying, oh no, I'm on the bench. No, 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 this should be me. No, I am the right person. Um, and I think as I progressed in my career, I was more thoughtful about messaging that that was my intent. That is what I wanted. I wanted to have that next level promotion and role and not getting distracted because people will distract you so many times and say, oh, well, you're a great seller. You should stay in the role because of the money. And they'll blah, 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 blah. give you all these anecdotes. Uh, and being really sure and not just taking kind of random roles that people thought might be interesting for me and saying, yep, not interested in that. I'm only interested in this particular role uh, was helpful for me being able to hone in and get the opportunity to compete for the roles, right? Um, and then certainly that next cycle of selling yourself starts. I'll pause there. Um, I think that is so consistent with themes and experiences that we've heard from other women on these panels. I know Jess is nodding her head. Um, I think she has a lot of thoughts on this topic. <laughs> Jess, why don't we go to you? Um, yes, I, I think um, as women, we unfortunately have always had to fight to have a seat at the table. And I think in my younger version of myself, in my young career, I was sort of an A student. So I kept my head down. I did my work really hard. I achieved a lot of success. And I just sort of thought, well, someone will notice and I'll get the opportunity to be promoted. And I thought that was how business worked. I thought that I would be promoted strictly based on merits. Um, that's not true, right? And <laughs> those that don't advocate for themselves are often left behind. And so as I progressed in my career, I became, to use your word, uh, Lila, thoughtful about how I wanted to progress. And I actively sought out individuals within organizations that I wanted to align myself to, wanted to emulate or learn from or grow in an experience so that I would feel more confident in advocating and in some cases demanding that I would be part of the review for the role or part of the conversation about the role. And I think it takes a lot of confidence to feel that you've earned that right. And it doesn't necessarily just happen from doing good work. It is a process and you have to have other advocates within the organization. And so when you have alignment um, and sort of that confidence and you've earned the right. Um, later in my career, I would say, this is what I want and this is what I'm going after. And I would make it very known and clear to everybody so that um, when the time came, I was the clear and obvious choice that when anyone thought about that role, they would say, that's Jess's role. You know, the one thing I might add to that is, and I love your points of view as far as making sure you had alignment making sure that people knew that you were interested in it. And I also had heard that so many times I'd be on you know, different events, trying to network, would tell me that and I'd be like, but how, but how right. do I align? <laughs> but what do I do? And one of the things that I learned that was super helpful for me to piggyback on your comment, Jess, around not just keeping your head down, A, learning how to advocate and practicing uh, kind of like why, why me and why this makes sense. But one of the things I learned was in keeping my head down, nobody knew all the goodness of Lila. And one That's of the right. ways I bridged that gap was the people, everyone who would be my peer in the role, once I got the promo, I decided to do stretch projects with those people. That's a lot of work. But it created an opportunity for them to see Lila in action outside of a deal or outside of a um, transaction. Because oftentimes in sales, the people who get the big deals that everybody works with and says are amazing 
end up getting all these opportunities. And sometimes they're not the best people to go into leadership. They are really good salespeople and they should stay there. But because everybody knows them and interact with them, it's a very easy thing to promote them because everybody assumes that they're the right people. And that's not always true. And so giving people an opportunity to engage with me and see how I, I ran a stretch project or see how I set up a meeting or see how I um, was involved with our DEI efforts or our women at efforts or some of the different ERGs that I've, I've had an opportunity to participate in, let them see like, wow, Lila is really great at these five things. I think she should be in leadership. And so starting to build that alignment and that kind of consensus so that when you're not in the room, people are talking about you in those ways enables you to have a much better position when you're going after uh, those types of roles. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Um, so for Jess, I know you've spoken publicly on Wise Panels, actually, about having the goal of getting to the CRO seat. That is like your aim. Can you speak a little bit about what the process of moving towards that position has been like? Um, what appeals to you about the CRO role? How can women decide if that's an appropriate goal for them? And if that is, what tips do you have for women who, who might want that same career trajectory? Yeah, a lot to unpack there. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm a fan I, of the multiple question thread, apparently. <laughs> um, I, I haven't been shy about sharing this story on panels before. Um, and around admitting that I've failed, right? I mean, I I thought that I would be a CRO or a, an executive by the time I was 30 or 35, and I thought I would have it all figured out and it would be not an easy path forward, but I thought that I would be able to move quicker than I had. Um, and here we are at 40 and, you know, I'm not a CRO yet, but I think um, I have stopped looking at career growth as this linear path forward and instead really looked at maybe horizontal skills that I've acquired or um, tangential skills that I've acquired. And those things I think have made me a much more well-rounded individual and a professional because my path to CRO has not been straight. It's been lateral moves sometimes. It's been looking at my entire skill set and saying, where do I have deficits and where can I go acquire those skills or those experiences that will then propel me forward in this process? Um, recently, I was promoted to SVP and to build out our vertical strategy. Yes, thank you. Um, and that was, that was an earned role. I made it very clear to kind of touch on our previous question. Um, when our new CRO joined our organization, one of the first conversations we had, I had a PowerPoint slide and I had all of the things that I had done that had impacted the business in my own business and at scale. And I was not shy about telling him all of the things I loved about our business, but all the things that needed to be changed and worked on and how I could directly influence and impact change in those areas. And when the time came to think about a vertical strategy, I was clear and obvious to Steve for that role. Um, that's gotten me one step closer and one step closer to the things I love to do, which is impact true business change, um, not only internally, but for our customers. Um, but I think you know that, that path is hard. It's hard to know what you wanna do. And, and I would never, uh, I, I don't pretend that I could sit here and opine about if that is the right role for everybody because the right role for everybody has to be self-determined. And if you want to just be an IC for the rest of your life, that is perfectly okay. I always hear sales individuals say they feel like they're not advancing their career because the leadership is pressing them. Well, just you've been an IC for so many years. Why don't you go into leadership? It's okay to do what you want to do. And I think it takes a lot of confidence to be able to say, I don't want to do that job. I want to do this job. You know, as we advocate to move forward, it's okay to advocate for whatever role it is that you want. Um, I know you asked a couple other things. <laughs> I, I think you got them all, but this conversation, I think, opens up a really interesting line of discussion. So Jess, you mentioned that when your new leadership came in, you were very open, not just about your achievements, but about what you were looking to do with your career next. Lila, how have you balanced being vocal and open, not only about your achievements, which we discussed, but more explicitly about your goals and not only with necessarily your managers, but your peers? 
just being open and saying, this is what I'm looking for. This is where I want my career to go. Um, you only get what you ask for, but at the same time, sometimes, you know, holding your cards close to the vest can give you a strategic advantage. So how do you balance that? It's interesting you should ask that because I was talking to some peers of mine and they were saying how they viewed me on the team. Cause I now actually lead a, a team of my peers, which is awful hard at performance time, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, but that being said, uh, one of the things that was really interesting is they're like, you know what, Lila, we really think you'd be a great leader for our team because while you're one of us, you never get involved in the politics. You're not overly engaged or have any favorites and you've been on the team for a while. So I was very mindful of the fact that I wanted to take that team over. <laughs> oh, I, I took the job at Google for this opportunity, period, right? Um, also, I believe in the products that we're doing. But in general, from a career perspective, I wanted to be in part of a high growth company so I could get opportunities to grow and go into leadership. So otherwise, it wouldn't have been worth it to move at the time that I moved. And so um, I always had that in mind. So I was very mindful of how I engaged with my colleagues, uh, which probably sounds like, oh, you're not being authentic. I knew that it would be very, very difficult to be professional if you are maybe one or two steps deeper with certain colleagues then is yeah. where you need to be as a leader. So super mindful of that. And I tried to always position and I was always putting myself of being in the role before I had it. So I dressed for the role. I put myself in conversations with leaders as though I already had the role. I connected with people who are two and three levels above me and talked about what was important to them across uh, the organization, not just in my little district. And so that, you know, as I was, uh, really positioning, and I always call it campaigning, for this opportunity, I already looked, smelled, felt like that person. As a matter of fact, my boss at the time who recommended me for the role, she's like, you're going to do a better job than I do. She's like, I mean, you will blow me away because you're so much better at this than I am, which is a wonderful uh, validation, but that just kind of gives you an idea. Of, I positioned and messaged as though I already had it. I think that's that's a very helpful tactical suggestion. Um, Jess, you talked a lot about this already in terms of having an open discussion with your leadership, but I'm curious, just as a small follow-up, were you that open with your peers and how did you navigate sort of that tricky dynamic? That is a, that is a great question um, because I, it's interesting. You would think that having female peers, it would be like, <laughs> drive and supportive and the male peers are the ones that would try and derail that but um i have been in the unfortunate position and probably many of us here i saw lila shake her head <laughs> i'm sure many of us have been in the uncomfortable position where our female peers view us strictly as competition yeah. and not as sisters in arms and I think having a tribe of women professionally is so incredibly important because you need to be lifted up by the women around you. Um, I think that when I was thinking about this role, um, I did transparently tell my team of peers that I was going for this and that I was not going to be vocal or not, not be vocal about wanting to advance my career and that my passion was leading leaders and impacting business change. And I think in I'm in a unique position because of tenure in leadership. The, the team that I'm peers with have a far less leadership experience than I do. Um, so it makes it a little bit more, I think, acceptable. But I'll tell you, it's it's really difficult to to work alongside some females that don't lift you up. And my remedy to that is I call it as it is. Like I call that out and I have a very direct and transparent conversation because ultimately you want to work together. You don't want to have that turmoil. You want the opportunity for you to pull your sister up. And that's how I view it. If I'm being promoted, I'm going to be your voice at the table. I'm going to be your advocate so that you get there right after me. Right. So you I'll save you a seat at the table versus there is only one seat at the table for one girl. There are plenty of seats for us, ladies. We can all wear crowns and we all should. <laughs> I like that. I like that, too. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, Lila, I want to talk a little bit about extracurriculars. 
um, which is not really something you hear about all that much once you've left school. Um, but I know for you, you do work outside of your day-to-day -day role at Google as an adjunct professor and sometimes even as a speaker. Um, how has that raised your profile at Google and or contributed to your success over the course of your career? And then more tactically, how might you suggest women use extracurriculars strategically to drive their careers forward? So yes, you've got a lot of different questions, like different layers. I love it. Um, so yes, extracurriculars. I love extracurriculars. I was like, can I just skip math and English and do all like extracurriculars? Like, no, I don't know, the fun stuff. Um, I hit a point in my career where just my day job wasn't enough. It wasn't fulfilling to me. I think I had really, really pushed hard for promotion, didn't get it. And I realized I had too much of my emotional capital wrapped up at work. And the opinions of people at work were like 100% of what I was uh, surrounding myself by. And so that was kind of an aha moment a long time ago. But one thing that I was encouraged to do and learn to do was to figure out what do I love? Never mind you know, what the next job or role is, but what do I love? And I've wanted to be a teacher since the beginning of time, but my parents talked me out of it because they're like, yeah, I don't know, you're gonna be broke if you do that. And I was like, oh, I'm not <laughs> so uh, I, I knew that lifelong learning for me was always important. I know that teaching people is a passion of mine. Uh, people say, what is your passion project? And it's always speaking, teaching, facilitating, and helping train people on how to live their best life. And that can be very trite and, and, and a lot of people use that. But that's, if you look at my podcast, that's that's what's in there. That's the things that I'm listening to. And I feel like it's so needed. And so those are the things I would do for free and often do. That being said, I figured out how to message saying, hey, listen, I'm already a seven or an eight in public speaking, teaching, training and facilitating. What opportunities do I have to flex those muscles in your business and have an impact? And people will always give you an answer. I did that on one-on-ones when I would go to skip levels. You don't want to talk about like, oh, I'm so great. I would, How can I help you? I'm a seven or eight. That got me a place on an uh, analyst panel. I got analyst training and got a chance to do this awesome trip. Just because I said that to the right person maybe two weeks before, and they were like, we should get you in the analyst panel. I'm like, great. So <laughs> my point is in figuring out what my strengths are and then messaging that I'd like to deploy that in your business. A, it gets me the kinds of stretch projects that are actually awesome. And I can naturally fit into. They're not like hours of cramming for a test that you're not good at. The other thing is it's kind of lifted my profile from being just a seller or just a manager to the thought leadership um, level. And that's ultimately where I want to be, right? Having done a lot of the different pieces of sales and understanding some of the operations, I am not an operations person. There are people who are better than that than I am. I am a sales leader and I'm a manager and I can do all of those uh, kind of brush your teeth activities. However, I am the best at inspiring people. So I want to work that muscle and bring more of that into what we're doing. And so ultimately, how, do, how was I able to do that is A, messaging the way that I did. And then B, raising my hand for opportunities, telling people, hey, here's my passion. Are there opportunities? That's how I got the opportunity to be an adjunct professor. They're like, hey, Lila, you know what? This seems like a natural fit for you. I'd have to interview for it. They were just like, can you do it on Monday at six? I'm like, sure. Um, I'm actually going to be teaching at Northwestern this semester as well. Wow, the modern. Uh, Very as cool. A professor in a couple of weeks. And that came from just knowing what I'm interested in and asking people for opportunities. And finally, I'll get off my soapbox on this one. Why do we do what we do? What is driving us? We're not always going to work for corporate America. What's next? How is the platform that you're on now and the things that you're doing now preparing you for when you don't have to necessarily worry about just keeping the lights on. And hopefully, especially those of us who are early in career, please hear me on this. Structure your life so you have options. So you don't have to work 25 to 30 years uh, with a, a life riddled in debt or where you've got an outsized lifestyle and you don't have options in your 50s. And I'm not saying that because that's me, but in sales, it's easy to be around the people who are like, I got the commission check and I got the business, <laughs> I got that. And, you know, you start to get into all the trappings of doing well. And sometimes you think that you have to message that way to show that you're successful. You want the guys or the girls or whatever, and you don't. Mm -hmm. the, the simpler you can make your life the, and the least complicated you can make your expenses will free you up so that you can spend your time doing what you love and what you're curious about. There's nothing worse than needing the 
executive who stayed too long <laughs> and they don't have another playbook <laughs> oh they don't i just build teams and you're like you know i don't know you like 70 like maybe you should do something that <laughs> you don't want to be single threaded so all of this relates back to my answer of stretch projects extracurriculars there's a meaning to that and there's a path there and i highly encourage you to think about it be multi-threaded and don't don't spend all your commission in one place Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a lot of richness and wonderful ideas there. And I just have to say, uh, I so distinctly remember being at one of my first high performance sales organizations and having the strongest performer make more money than he ever had in his entire life and run out of it three months into the job. I think that's actually something that doesn't get talked about enough in sales training sometimes and can be a really big problem. Um, but bringing it back to our original question of extracurriculars, uh, Jess, I'm going to be a little bit on the nose here, but for you, WISE has been a pretty big commitment. As you mentioned, you've been on a bunch of panels. Um, it's You've been a wonderful supporter of ours. Sales Loft is now a sponsor. How did you think about getting involved in this organization or, or the other organizations and sort of bringing it back to my question to Lila? How have you used that to raise your profile, drive success forward in your career? Or even just for me, it's a really big outlet when things aren't going well at work. I can channel some of my frustration into a different activity, um, but would love to hear a little bit in terms of your thoughts on that. Yes, um, I I actually went to school to be a teacher, Lila. <laughs> there you go. I, I feel you in that, that love of teaching, and I think that's why I love leadership so much. Um, I didn't end up being a teacher because at 21, I realized I did not have the patience required to be a seventh grade teacher. And so to sales, right? Because that's that was my only option at the time. It was that or law school. And sales seemed an easier path. Um, but what I the reason I love WISE and all of the other sort of groups that I'm a member of or um, leading is because I am extremely passionate about women in technology and women in sales and the advocacy for women for having a voice at the table. So when I connect to a mission so passionately i want to be involved it's the teacher in me it's the a student in me like i want to be at everything i want to have a voice and i want to raise others voices so for me having a passion like that and be able to share that here but not only here in the organizations i've been a part of i've been lucky at salesforce i was able to build that women in technology group in the chicago hub at linkedin I was a global executive at the Women at LinkedIn. Um, and at Sales Loft, I'm the co-founder and chair of our Women's Integrated Network. And for me, that is my extracurricular, which is giving a forum and a, a safe space for women to talk about the things that are on their minds and keeping them up at night in relation to work, about being a mom at work, about doing this remote now and balancing career progression and compensation conversations and validation. And I'll, I'll never forget, I was in the bathroom stall with one of my best friends talking about my promotion. I had the interview that day and we were doing power poses in the stall. <laughs> and in that moment, I was like, God, like everyone should have this person in their life. And I was inspired to want to be in the bathroom stall with all of you ladies giving you the power poses so that you felt encouraged and confident to go forward in your career. And so with that, it has brought some notoriety and some speaking opportunities um, and panel opportunities. And I'm well known within my organization for um, being able to tell great stories and being able to be a voice for um, not just sales off, but the women at our company. So. Um, it certainly has given me that opportunity to really dive into something I'm passionate about and love, but also it's helped my organization see that there is value in having women speak for their organization and sort of be the face. So. Absolutely. Um, I have said you, you talking about power posing brings back such a vivid memory of like, psyching myself up for an interview and like power posing on the back of a Manhattan block where no one could see me and Jess, where were you? It would have been nice to have that company. <laughs> I'll be there um, next I'm sure uh, all the people on the street were like, what is that person doing in her suit? Like walking around like Superman. But, 
Um, okay, so let's let's go there, right? This is a, a conversation about promotion. We have to talk about money, right? So let's talk about it. Let's talk about compensation and promotion. Um, one of the weirdest dynamics that's got to exist in sales is sometimes if you're a really good individual contributor, getting promoted doesn't necessarily always mean more money. Sometimes it means less money. Um, so have your expanded roles always been accompanied by, by an increase in compensation? Um, would you ever or have you ever accepted a promotion without a compensation increase? And sort of how do you think about that trade off? Um, Lila, we'll, we'll go to you and then just circle back around to you. So yes, and uh, people will often tell you like, hey, if you want to be a, you know, in sales and sales management and sales executive, you're going to have people on your team who are going to make way more than you. And you've got to be OK with that. And I think that's a huge kind of a flag for emotional intelligence. If you're still worried about what other folks are making, you're not ready. Like you're not ready for leadership. That's a great litmus test. If that really bothers you, you're probably not ready. Um, have I taken, I have taken roles that were lateral. I have taken roles where um, maybe it wasn't the best situation, but I was going to learn something new and broaden my skill set. Uh, so I always kind of have a decision tree around uh, kind of what does it make sense to take a role or promotion and then what is the upside, right? Uh, that being said, of all careers, in my opinion, what I've seen, sales management still has a performance-based component to it. So oftentimes, especially in technology, uh, you know, there might be a company plan or like the plan that everybody's on who does like administrative jobs. And then you've got a sales plan where there's bonus, commission, and salary. Typically, even though you may not be making as much as your the people on your team who blow it out, you're still on a leveraged model. And you don't always get leadership roles that are, you know, in leveraged models. And so uh, I think that's something to keep in mind just in general, like that's an upside of being in sales management because it can still be leveraged. So you don't have to, you know, talk yourself into how do I reel back from commission checks quarterly, right? Because that's that's a thing for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, to, not to over answer, but in general, it, I've always made moves that were going to help me grow in some way. Uh, and so even if the money wasn't there, it was still worth it. That's a great way to think about it. Um, Jess, what about you? How, what's your experience been balancing those two levers, sort of money and advancement? Um, I, I tend to agree with Lila. I think any, it depends on how I viewed the advancement and the role. Um, if it was a lateral move, but I knew I was gonna acquire a different skill set or experience, but the money was the same, I placed more value on that. Um, and it, I think it really depends on where you are in your sort of career path. I think where I am now moving into roles that require a lot more from me, a lot more time commitment, a lot more um, involvement and more strategy, whatever it is, um, I place a high value on that experience, but also that I'm worth being paid what I should be for that role. Um, so I think it's, it's a balance of what do you what do you need at that time, right? At that point in time, do you need skills and experience or do you need the finances to sort of coincide with that? Yeah. It just depends. I think that makes sense. It's such a personal question, right? Especially as you start to think about what women might have going on outside of the office. Maybe this is a year where like, you really can't make the investment in yourself, but next year you might be able to, um, depending on what's going on on the home front as well. Um, so I have one last question from our script, and then we have a very active Q&A going on down here. Um, so we'll start to answer some of those. This may not be relevant, but I always like to ask it. Um, I guess we'll start with Lila since we just wrapped up with you, Jess. Have you ever turned down a promotion or an opportunity to take on an expanded role because you didn't think it was a good fit for you? You mentioned a decision tree. Has your decision tree ever came back with a, no, don't do this, Lila? <laughs> oh my God, yes. <laughs> I also call it my spidey senses, right? And again, I think it goes back to being really clear about what experiences you want to have. And that doesn't come right away. So you got to give yourself some time. But once you do get crystal clear, it's very easy to say, okay, great, that's a promotion. It's going to require me to switch companies or it's going to require me to switch teams, which then I have to build political capital in those teams. It's going to require me, anytime it's a new role, it's an investment, right? So you're going to be working 60, 90 hours a week for the next six months to a year. 
is that time worth it away from my family? We have two kids and Doug and Sugar. So is that worth it, right? And are there any other paths that can get me there, right? Those are the things that I think of. And then finally, it comes down to, am I in love with the title? <laughs> yes. Does it just make me feel good? <laughs> am I in love with the money? Do I need the money that much? How much value do you put on your time? And then usually you'll come down to, okay, is this worth it or is it not? I do typically try to peel the emotion away from it as, as well as whatever the recruiter or the people who are trying to, you know, trying to get you to say yes, peel that out as well. Um, and then just kind of see how I feel about it and how it kind of aligns into my values, which I always talk about, and you may have heard me, is the five Fs, family, finances, fitness, fun, and then my faith just in, in, in you know, being a good person and, and doing good things. So if it doesn't align there, or I think those things are going to be seriously hemorrhaging for a long time, it really isn't worth it. There'll yeah. be other opportunities that come along and people will try to make you believe it. Like, no, you don't have to do it. There will be other opportunities. And I think we have to trust ourselves to, to really go with that. And I think that's something that comes with confidence. I turned down earlier this year, a job that, I think three or four years ago, I never would have had the confidence to walk away from because I don't know that I have a 5F rubric, but my spidey senses were like, this is not a good life plan. <laughs> These vibes you are getting from the interview process, they're not going to get any better. Um, it's like when you go on a first date and you're like, they're never going to treat you any better than they are now. So if you're already having concerns, anyways, um, I think that rings true. And I think who among us can't say they haven't been seduced by a big title? Um, Jess, I'd love to hear your perspective because I know that you have made some moves across a couple of different organizations in the last few years and have navigated that pretty deftly. Um, I, I, again, tend to agree with a lot of what Lila said. I will say, um, I think oftentimes, sometimes promotions are often offered to women with a scarcity mentality. Like this is the only promotion you're ever going to get. You know, it's, oh, it's super time sensitive. We need an answer right away. Um, or women inherently think, oh God, if I don't take this promotion, will I be in bad standing with this manager? Will they tell the others that I turned, I had the audacity to turn down a promotion or will this hinder me from being considered for the next role? I want to tell you those are all valid concerns, but you shouldn't be concerned about that because as Lila said, there is always going to be another role that is better fit for you. There's always going to be another promotion. And if there isn't, you're at a sinking company and you should get out anyways. <laughs> but if you're in a healthy, stable organization that's growing, there's going to be plenty of caps. Have I turned down roles before? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's a combination of, again, where I'm at in that point in time what I need and what is the risk reward for that role, right? What am I giving up? Because you always give up something even when you're getting promoted. It's not always a get, get, you are giving to get always. And so what is that risk reward for me? Um, and if the reward doesn't outweigh the risk, then it's a no. And then, you know, it's gonna be a no for me, dog. Just if anyone <laughs> out there that used to watch that show. <laughs> I like that. Right. Um, okay, we are going to go to Q&A from our audience. Thanks, guys, for being such an engaged audience. Um, and Jess, we're going to give you the first bite at the apple on this one. Um, once you get, this is from Gina. Once you get promoted to a leadership position, how would you say attitude and maturity level needs to change? Thanks for your question, Gina, and thanks for joining us today. Um, yes. So stepping into a leadership role does require a shift in how you think about maturity, um, how you think about, um, well, especially for leading your peers. That's a whole other situation. I'll let Lila tackle that. But um, I think you probably already have to possess a level of those two things to be promoted into a leadership role, right? You have to be able to sort of see the forest through the trees, think a little bit more holistic not be political um, because the job is taxing and it will require you to take on more emotional uh, baggage than you are bringing to that role because essentially 
being in leadership means you're being a psychologist, you're being a, a caretaker, you are being a best friend, an educator, a disciplinarian, a teacher, all of the things wrapped into one. Um, and then that requires a level of maturity that um, I think lesser experienced people probably don't have and probably won't be successful in the world. I don't know, Lila, you probably have some words of wisdom to add in there. Uh, a total plus one. Um, <laughs> just a total plus one on that one. I think you nailed it. Um, well, that's great because we have lots of other questions coming in. Um, okay, we're gonna go to Kara now. So Kara, and I'll let you start with this one, Lila. How do you think about leading? And I think this is actually a great question for you given that you're managing a team of your peers also. How do you think about leading in an environment in which you have significantly fewer years of professional experience? How do you find the balance between being decisive and confident with being inclusive and seeking feedback? And Kara seems to be like me. She's added a little bit of a coda. She said more specifically, few years of fewer years of professional experience than the peers of those that you would be leading. Wow, that is that is tough. So Kara, great question. And that is tough. However, it goes back to really having an emotional, having emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence doesn't have an age. There's people who are been in their careers for 20 years that aren't emotionally mature. So I think if we believe the narrative about ourselves that, well, we're inexperienced or, oh, we're young or, oh, all the people on my team are men or, oh, whatever the poor me statement is, and we believe that, then that will be true. However, if we show that even though we might be not as tenured in other people's level of experience, but we have the tenacity, drive, and ability to do the job just as well, if not better than other people, and we stick to that story. And how do we stick to that story? Whenever anybody says something, well, you know, you're, or you're so young or whatever, you know, like the things that people say and they're not thinking about it and they're not being as inclusive, it's very easy to say, I have got just as much experience as you. I haven't had an opportunity to flex that muscle yet, but I have got just as much experience in X, Y, and Z as you. And just kind of really challenging those statements could potentially help you change the narrative because it's just a narrative, right? And what makes it true is we believe it. If we stop believing the narrative, then we can question if it's true. Now, that's not too, I hope that's not too philosophical, but it is in fact the case because these are all just emotions that you're managing. They may or may not be reality. That is a good point. There are scripts that we are certainly all playing in our head over and over again. Um, Jess, what are your thoughts on that? I would love to answer that. Hi, Kara. So happy for your question. Um, this is what I think about that situation. Let go of any insecurity you have about you not having as much experience. What does that even mean? Your experience is your story. And what you bring to the table is so much different than what anybody else brings to the table and you need to own that. It does not mean age, it does not mean emotional intelligence, you have more than anyone. It does not mean that you're less equipped because you have less years of experience. Quite frankly, some of the people your peers would probably love having one of their own, and Lila could probably attest to this, having one of their own lead them. They know that you have been through the trenches. They know that you understand the hardships of the job. They know that you have been successful, so you have credibility. What you need to do, Kara, is stop getting in your own way and own up that you are ready for this job. You earned the right, and you should own it and I will call you after and kick your butt if you don't move forward with this. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Personal you know, follow-up on one of our panelists. I'm gonna um, put one on that because one of the biggest challenges, especially as women that we have, is that we never move past kind of the individual contributor role and get into leadership roles. Getting into a first line manager role is one of the hardest leaps you'll probably have to ever make. However, it is worth it. We will not start to change the numbers at the top and the leadership at the top and the number of women who have an opportunity to have an impact if we don't ever get past that first hurdle. And we fall out of the race so often because of all of the things that you would assume, right? Uh, 
taking ourselves out of the race for maybe family, taking ourselves out of the race to maybe caretake for el elderly people, uh, or just not having the confidence to compete. And so those are reasons why we are not as well represented in a lot of organizations. And it's our responsibility, in my opinion, as women, whether we see ourselves there or not, but to enable others to have that experience so that our daughters uh, see a lot of women just like them who are leading and having these incredible lives and know that it's possible. You can't aim for what you don't know exists, right? That's why representation is so important of women, of diversity of thought, of diversity of background. Um, when you are young in your career, it is hard to imagine yourself in a seat if no one who looks like you is sitting in that seat. Um, so I could not agree more about needing to model that. Um, so this is a question that's great for both of you, and it comes from Cecilia. From Celia, sorry, I apologize. Um, she says one of her extracurriculars these days is developing a community internally for the women in sales at her company. Uh, what yeah. advice do you have for starting the community? Any advice for finding t speakers, trainers, coaches, um, or building that community? I know you guys are both really involved in the ERGs at your various workplaces. Uh, I can't remember who started first. Um, Jess, we'll go with you. Okay. Um, yes. Well, first of all, Celia, thanks for your question and congrats on thinking about this and implementing it at your organization. Um, one of the key things I would say is you need to have an executive sponsor because there will be a lot of asks. And if you don't have an executive sponsor, it will just be another group that unfortunately fails. So find a strong woman leader or even a male ally that you can go to to have that executive sponsorship. Secondly, be really thoughtful about the mission. It's easy to say we want to start a company, but about what that mission is or what you're trying to accomplish at your company. That will help tailor your messaging, how you recruit people, and even the speakers and panelists you have come on board. Um, some things that have been really successful and easy to do over Zoom are book clubs. It's a great way to disseminate some great information and all sort of come from the same place or get on the same page to have a great discussion. I recommend Untamed. It's a fabulous book. Gospel <laughs> Brennan. I love Brennan Doyle. She's a hero of mine. Highly recommend that book. It will get you talking. Um, but yeah, just be really thoughtful about what you're trying to accomplish and make sure you have that sponsorship. That's great. Super tactical advice. And I cannot agree more about Glennon Doyle. It's hard to think of anyone who wouldn't like her. Um, Milo, what about you? What do your experiences working at ERGs at Google um, suggest about how Celia can be successful in this endeavor? Yeah, great question. So I think Jess covered really some great points, right? Um, the only thing I might add to that is, you know, after you've gotten your executive sponsorship, you know what your mission is, you know, you've, you've got, had a couple of connections, is think about how you're going to measure it. Right. So it's one thing to be a party planner. I hate to say it like that. But that's yeah. how it feels if you don't have a way to me measure your success. So I'm a huge fan of saying yes to things that have measurable impact and saying no to things that just seem interesting. Uh, and here's why everybody has to figure out a way to prioritize their time. So if you've got a here's our mission in the next six months, we aim to increase membership by that. 50% or we want to increase engagement by X percent, which will be measured by survey responses or whatever your metric is that you think is achievable. Because a lot of times they're like, well, how do you know it's working? People come up, whatever it may be, you want it to be something that you can list as an accomplishment, right? You want this to add to your leadership capabilities, right? And so in doing that, if you've got the things that Jess mentioned, and you've got some metrics that you can show. Let me show you my survey monkey results, right? Those are always things that give validation to your time. That's the only thing I might add. Great. That is a great additional point. Um, thank you for your question, Celia. We're going to go to a question from Indra. Um, Indra is interested in finding a mentor. Uh, what have been your experiences when it comes to finding a mentor within your organization or externally? Are there best practices for starting those conversations? Um, Lila, why don't we start with you? So wonderful question. Is it Indira? What a great name. Uh, that name. I think it makes sense to think about what you're looking to accomplish. And I hate to say that, 
But again, I'm a huge fan of being thoughtful about how I proceed. And so if you're looking for a mentor, someone who can provide coaching, help, be a shoulder to cry on when you need it, that's one thing. But if you are in fact really looking for sponsorship, understand the difference. I always say sponsorship opens doors. If you want somebody who's going to open a door for you, then you may want to engage that person in a different way. If you're looking for a mentor, you might just be looking for somebody who you can connect with or maybe somebody who's in your immediate work group or maybe somebody who has a similar role in a different region. It just kind of depends. I'll never forget being at an event, I think it was at Microsoft, and there was somebody on stage squawking about how important this was. And I say squawking because they were squawking. And uh, I was very impressed by a number of the things that they said, even though it was somewhat long. And at the end of it, I went up and I was like, hey, you know what? I'm new to Microsoft and I'm looking to do X, Y, and Z. I need some help. And he said, well, who are you going to ask? I was like, I'm asking you. <laughs> you are now my mentor. I need your help. I was very specific. Like, no, it's you. And that really helped out. Uh, of course, I'm more obviously aggressive that way, but that really helped me to be able to manage through one particular situation that I knew he could help me with. So long story made short, I think it's important to figure out what is it you're trying to accomplish. Understand if you're looking for a sponsor or a mentor, and then be very mindful about the people that you're engaging with. Either just somebody of a personal connection, but like, oh man, you know, I can really connect with them on a personal level, or somebody like. Maybe we're not going to be, you know, braiding each other's hair and like, you know, sipping Cosmopolitans if people still drink that together. But I can probably have a 30 minute one on one with them once a quarter and bounce ideas off of them. I think that delineation is really crucial. Understanding and being clear about what are you looking to get out of that relationship and approaching it with that in mind as opposed to just a broad goal of mentorship. Um, Jess, I don't know if you have anything to add on that or would also love to hear a little bit about how you think about mentorship within your organization or outside of the four walls of your organization. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with the delineation between sponsorship and mentorship, two totally different things. Um, the only thing I'll add about mentorship is um, it's, it's work and it should be work on your behalf, not the mentor. As the mentee, you need to come to the table with explicit um, needs and requests and sometimes solutions, right? Because essentially as a mentor, you know, they're taking time out of their day to engage with you and it has to be mutually beneficial. So I always say, if you find a mentor, make it mutually beneficial. Make sure that they are going to get something out of that exchange. Um, internally, I think mentors are great in, if you're thinking about your next role or your next role role, um, getting someone's perspective internally that has been through that career path is super important. Um, again, those are the people that can also advocate for you and can turn eventually into sponsors. Um, I also really agree with having voices that are outside of your organization. So having a mentor that doesn't do what you do or isn't in the same company as you or maybe even not in the same department. Um, those different perspectives can be extremely valuable. Um, groups like WISE are a great place to find mentors, right? Um, or cool. other, right? There's uh, huh? groups about it as well. Um, I tend to find mentors that can really help me acquire knowledge or experience that I'm seeking. Um, so I tend to be very, very specific about the mentors I choose, um, but I do always balance having internal and external points of view. The only thing I might add to that is I do know that earlier in career, one of the great, and I still, I don't have as many opportunities to do it now, but it was so rich and wonderful when I did have those opportunities. I made some of my customers my mentors. I had my board of directors, if you've ever heard of that. A board of directors yeah. is somebody that you might build. So it's like the board of directors of Lila Inc., right? And whenever I was considering making a move or a change, I would go to them and I would ask, what am I not thinking of? What things haven't I considered? And on that board of direction, directors would be people from inside my organization, but I always said one or two customers on there, like people who I'd sold to in the past, maybe they're the CEO of the organization, people that we had some kind of a connection that were way more advanced or more, more experienced than me. I would say, hey, listen, here's what I'm thinking. What would you do? Or how, how do you think about this? And that was extremely beneficial 
uh, because it gave me a really well-rounded perspective uh, and helped me message a lot better when I had the opportunities. So that's something you might consider. I think that's such great advice. When I was early on in my career, I had a group of women who we called ourselves the board of directors for each other's career. And every year at we used to work in finance and at compensation time, we'd practice going through our review spiel with our managers, asking for the raise, and it was so beneficial. Um, but I love the idea of pulling in customers that you've sold to, that they have such a unique and uh, valuable perspective. I think that's a great idea. Um, we have one last question to wrap up, and I, I think it's a great one because it circles back to themes we've been talking about. So I know, Lila, you did a great job of laying out your five F frameworks. Um, so Morgan's question is, how did or how do you choose what kind of leadership position you're looking for or which ones are right for you? Jess, I'd love to hear a little bit about your framework. How have you sort of thought about that? Not specifically to any one role, but sort of what's that process look like for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I use this lens even when I'm looking at organizations, which is, is that organization connected to a mission that I feel passionate about? Like, am I going to feel really good about being my authentic self in this organization where I can lead from a certain leadership perspective and where I can bring myself and my whole team self to work? every single day it's so so important so for me i always look through the lens of culture is that role going to check my boxes of culture mission driven uh, leadership style growth um that's kind of the lens i do a lot of things through um, especially when i'm looking at things in my personal life because i give up a lot i have a four-year-old or could be four-year-old for november going so so fast but I give up time with him and I give up time with my husband and it has to be worth it. For me. So when I think about uh, the right type of leadership role, is it going to bring more than it's going to take away? Right, again, back to that risk reward. I'm very big on pros and cons and risk and reward and really evaluating things uh, from that perspective. But it's really important to be able to be me in that leadership role. And if that's going to require me to make uh, any sort of change to who I am in my authentic self, then it's not the right role for me. And it probably wouldn't be the right role for you either. Um, we are who we are, and we should celebrate that. We shouldn't take roles that will hide that or diminish that in any way. So that's why I do it. That is such a great final answer from you to end on, Jess. And I think it echoes a lot of themes in what Lila talked about and her framework and thinking about where are the trade offs and how are they lining up with their values. Lila, do you have anything to add? I know we covered some of this in your earlier answer. Uh, no, I would say that, you know, in general, it really does go back to, you know, what are your values? What's most important to you, right? And again, if you don't know, take some time to figure that out. Take a step back and figure that piece out or spend at least as much time on that as you are thinking about the next one. I think that is a wonderful note to end on. Um, thank you, first and foremost, to our exceptional speakers, guys. This was such an engaging, tactical, and really thoughtful conversation. I know I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm sure our virtual listeners and viewers did as well. Um, this is our last WISE Chicago panel of the year, but there are other WISE panels. And the nice thing about all of us being stuck at home is that Location is relative, so you can dial into all of the panels. Um, but thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to the audience for such lively Q&A. Uh, and thank you to you lovely ladies. Thanks for spending your Wednesday night with us. Awesome. Thanks for having us. See you guys later. Bye, everybody. Bye.